Can you hear me okay? All right, so thank you all for allowing me to be here today. My name is Omar Osgar, and yes, I'm a fellow here at MD Anderson. And um, I'm a fellow in orbital oncology and orbital plastic surgery. So we deal with a lot of diseases in and around the eyeball. And so today I thought we can go over some of the basics about the eye and about the orbit, just to give some background about what it is with the eye that gets affected with ECD and uh, how those effects come about and how we go about diagnosing those, those problems. So we'll talk about what ECD can do to the eyes, as, as you all know, some of these effects. Um, and then also I wanted to talk about a general eye exam and what it is that we do and what we're looking for with each step so that it's not so much of a mystery of, of um, when we're dilating the drops. It's not that we just want to dilate you and blur you for the day. Um, oh, and most importantly, feel free at any time to ask me any questions. There's a lot of material I was going to cover. And uh, um, so it's okay if we don't finish through all of this since there's so much. Um, this is sort of like um, anatomy of the I-101. So uh, please feel free to stop me. So when you look at the eye, so just starting from the basics, you see the eyelids and the eyelashes, of course, but you also see the colored part of the eye. That colored part of the eye is the iris. It's actually a muscle, and it's within the eye. It's not the eye surface itself. So actually, let me switch to the laser pointer here. So that's this colored part right here. So in this picture, we have a side view of the eye, and that colored part is right here. It's the iris. It's, it's actually a muscle. And the black part of the eye, when you're looking at somebody, is the pupil. It's actually a hole. And that iris, when it constricts and relaxes, it adjusts the size of that pupil so that more or less light can come in. So overlying that colored part is the cornea. It's a clear, transparent tissue. And the cornea is one of the most sensitive parts of the body. That's why if somebody has dry eyes or gets a scratch in the eye, that's why it's so sensitive. But thankfully, because it's so sensitive, a lot of cells come in to heal the, the cornea when it's affected. So it's a, it heals very well whenever there's a problem. So besides the colored part of the eye, around the outside is the white of the eye. And the white of the eye, as you can see, some, can sometimes get red, as a lot of people know. And the redness comes from the blood vessel that supplies actually a transparent membrane over that white of the eye. It's called the conjunctiva. That conjunctiva is a very, very thin, transparent tissue with a lot of blood vessels. And blood vessels, like anywhere else in the body, can get inflamed. And when it gets inflamed, it gets red. And instead of being a clear tissue, it becomes a reddish tissue, and that's why the white of the eye turns reddish. Um, but that's uh, sort of the outside of the eye. And if we take a chunk out of the eye so that we can see the insides of the eye, you can see, again, the cornea at the front, then the iris with the pupil, which is a hole, and right behind it is the lens. The lens is an amazing structure in the eye that can actually change shape. And the change of shape is what allows us to focus from something far in the distance to up close. So it's because that lens can change shape. And the goal of it changing shape is to focus light exactly at the inner surface of the back of the eye on something called the retina. And the retina is this orangish tissue in this picture here. It's the, you can think of it as a wallpaper of the inside of the eye. And right at the center of it is something called the macula. The macula is the central area of focus. So when you're looking at me or at the board, it's the macula that's allowing you to see the fine detail. And all the rest of the retina helps you with the peripheral vision. And all these squiggly lines here, those are the blood vessels supporting the retina. And right in the center of those squiggly, squiggly lines is something called the optic nerve head, or the optic disc. That's the start of the cable system that connects the eyeball to the back of the head at the brain. So in this next picture, you can see the two eyes with the cable system going back towards the brain. And they meet in something called the optic chiasm. And that chiasm is where a lot of fibers cross over. And so the visual information from the right eye goes to the left side of the brain and vice versa. So it's that area where 
things sort of switch up. So on physical exam, when we look into your eyes, we can actually see the frontmost part of the optic nerve. And that's what these pictures on the right side show. It's a little hard to see, but at the top, that optic nerve has a pink, healthy appearance to it. The second um, picture here shows swelling of that optic nerve head. And swelling is an indication that there's something going on behind, uh, behind the eyeball. And that something can either be inflammation of the optic nerve from infection or from compression, something pressing on the optic nerve. And finally, the bottom picture shows um, atrophic changes, so atrophy of that optic nerve. There's paleness of the color, there's thinning of the nerve fibers, and we can actually see that on physical exam. There's close to two million nerve fibers that run through the system sending visual information from the retina out towards the optic nerve to the brain. Um, so we can actually see if there's damage to those nerve fibers. I know there's a lot of information, so <laughs> any questions yet? Okay. So now the eyeball itself, it sits in a compartment called the orbit. The orbit is the bony cavity of where not just the eye sits, but also all the structures supporting the eye. So we have um, these red fibers that are the muscles of the eye. And those muscles can control the eyes and make them move up and down, left and right. But it, call, it can also twist a little bit. So those muscles are very important in being able to um, move the eye and keep them in sync with the other eye. There are nerves that control each of those muscles. And there's that big thick nerve coming from the back of the eye, which is the optic nerve. Then there are blood, uh, blood vessels that support all of those structures as well. And then in this upper picture, you can see some yellowishness, which is the orbital fat. The orbital fat is actually very important to provide cushioning and to provide a sorting uh, support structure for the eye to be able to move freely. Um, then up and out, so up and out within the orbit is something called the lacrimal gland. And this is one of the glands of the eye that produces the tear film, or part of the tear film. So when somebody cries, the lacrimal gland is getting activated to secrete more tears. And when there's an overflow of tears, there's actually a drainage system out towards the nose. There are two little dots that feed into a tubular structure called the nasolacrimal duct. And that feeds down into the back of the, the nose and throat. So that's why if somebody's crying, you might notice that your nose runs, and that's, that's the reason why. It's the lacrimal gland feeding that tear duct system. Now the eyelid also plays a very important role in keeping the eye healthy. There are oil glands, and in this picture, it's a, a diseased um, eyelid showing this thick secretion. Uh, it just makes it easier to see where the oil glands are in this state. So these little white specks, should really be more like olive oil texture. And it should flow into the tear film. And that oiliness helps um, provide lubrication to the eye. And it also helps to prevent tears from drying out. If that eyelid structure is not working well, then the eyes can get dry and very uncomfortable. If there's enough inflammation causing a backup of that oil, then you can almost get a little bump like you see in this picture here. And that could be the formation of a sty or chalazion. And finally, when we're looking at the eye in the orbit, one very important tool we use is a CT or MRI scan. And I wanted to sort of take the mystery out of, of what it is that we're looking at in the computer when, when you're in the exam room. So if you imagine the skull as a three-dimensional structure, then we are representing that on a computer in a two-dimensional way. And the way we do that is we call it slices. So if you have the, the structure here, we could either look at slices going this way, or we call it a coronal plane, or this way, an axial plane. And we present that on the computer in this fashion so that we can look at different parts of the eye and orbit from different angles. And we can tell if there's inflammation somewhere in the eye, or we can see the connections of the optic nerve back to the brain. And the CT and MRI, they may look similar, but the CT scan is very quick, uh, very um, fast, and it provides excellent detail of the bony structure. 
And the MRI takes longer, but it gets excellent visualization of the optic nerves and the soft tissue and the brain structures. So we can use them in different ways. So that's our crash course in anatomy. Any questions yet? <laughs> OK. So now ECD. Um, I know a lot of us um, are aware of some of the changes that can happen to the eyelids and the orbit. So I just wanted to talk briefly about that. So as we know, um, ECD can cause a rare infiltrative non-Langerhans cell type infiltration of various tissues throughout the body. And the orbit is very commonly affected with ECD. And um, I know a lot of this is covered in other sections, so I, I'm going to not go too much into the technical detail, but I'll go into sort of the overview. Orbital involvement is actually found in over a quarter of patients with ECD, uh, probably higher than that. It's probably a bit underdiagnosed. And um, we talked about all these structures of the eye, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the anatomy is, um, is that this infiltration of tissue can happen anywhere within the body and anywhere within the orbit. And depending on where it happens within the eye or orbit, it can cause effects of those structures. And um, for example, if there's an orbital lesion, so a lesion behind the eyeball, it's a very tight space with not a lot of room 